His work has been featured at the Whitney Biennale, the Tate Modern, and the Brooklyn Museum. And he's widely regarded as one of the most important artists of his generation. Mm -hmm. Here to discuss his latest exhibition, his life in black and white, and his foray into fashion design is Sanford Biggers. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Sanford, you have so much going on right. this year. My goodness. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a wild time right it's now. It's a wild time. Mm -hmm. Well, it's about to be a wild time later this week because <laughs> you're art directing an event for Absolute Vodka. I know mm -hmm. it's a private and secret mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. We can't share the location, mm -hmm. but Sorry. what can you tell us about what's going to be happening that evening? What can Shannon and I expect? Well, um, that evening I will basically be taking care of all the artistic direction of the venue, mm -hmm. uh, which means you will be walking into a living and breathing Sanford Biggers installation. Um, there will be clouds of raw cotton, there'll be dance steps on the floor and the ceiling and the pillars, there'll be uh, a wall that you can make into a large quilt, there'll be musical instruments, and of course you'll have great entertainment as well. Well, speaking of entertainment, Santa Gold and Questlove are expected to be there, mm. and I understand that you've designed costumes for them as well. Talk to mm -hmm. us about that process, and what was it like collaborating, collaborating with those two? Well, sure. Um, uh, Santi and I have been friends for a while, and mm -hmm. we've been talking about doing a project, and uh, it just so happens that the opportunity came up. So I'll be doing some uh, costume design for her and her dancers. I'm not doing so much for Quest, but uh, I think uh, energetically I'll be pushing some <laughs> musical flavors. He just needs an Afro pick anyway. Yeah, pick. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was it very collaborative with, between you all? Did they have their inputs? Like, I don't like that. Okay, do this, do that. Yeah, it was a, a lot of back and forth, but uh, we've been paying each other, uh, paying attention to each other's aesthetics for a while. Mm. So I actually do think we've already been feeding off of each other for the last few years. Mm. So this was just a perfect opportunity for us to. Uh, push that together into a proper collaboration. I love it. Well, let's talk about your new exhibition, yes. Dark Star, that opened last week. My goodness, you don't have enough on your plate. <laughs> I know, I know. I just keep and it's, piling it on. It's at um, the gallery in East Hampton? East Hampton, okay. the Eric Firestone Gallery. And it features a lot of quilts. I know mm -hmm. that that is a recurring motif mm -hmm. in a lot of your work. Why did you decide to visit the world of quilts again? And why is this... Why is this important to you? Well, two things are happening. My work is usually uh, you know, filled with many layers, and one of the layers being the conceptual, and the other being the aesthetic. And conceptually, quilts have been of interest to me because uh, there's been rumors of quilts being used on the Underground Railroad. Mm. So as escaping slaves were moving from the south to the north, at night, they would sometimes come upon a safe house that had quilts either folded a certain way or certain patterns on display, which would give instructions like tonight it's safe to stay here or we're under surveillance, keep moving or turn left at the river up ahead. And I like the idea of this embedded language that is potentially in, you know, imbued inside of the, the quilt. Mm -hmm. So as I take antique quilts, all the quilts I use are pre-1900s. As I use those, I'm embedding yet another layer of coded language. So it's not so much about how you see them today, but how they'll be seen 50, 100 years from now, mm -hmm. and how somebody can maybe decipher all those multiple layers. And what are some of the encoded languages that you're incorporating into it now? Well, I think I've been developing a symbolic language over the last few years. One reoccurring image is what I call <coughs> a lotus. Mm -hmm. um, and I lived in Japan for several years, mm -hmm. and while there I got very interested in, in Buddhism. And the mandala is one of the central symbols of Buddhism. So I've made my own mandala, which, is cons that, which consists of several slave ships, the cross sections of slave ships, one of those mm -hmm. historical diagrams, uh, put in myriad form to make a circle. So at first glance, it's this beautiful, seductive lotus blossom mandala. But the closer you get, you see the horrific truth of how many of our ancestors ended up here on the shores of Northern America. Mm. Wow, you're really getting cool. deep there. <laughs> it seems like a lot of your work, you know, involves deep thought things and abstract designs where mm -hmm. even sometimes you don't put words or text on the wall. You just mm -hmm. let the people figure out what it's saying. Why mm -hmm. do you choose to do that with your art? Well, I think um, art, um, you know, along with music and food and fashion and all of these things is a very visceral experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, rather than make something that is strictly visually appealing, I like it also to have something that touches you deeper. Once mm -hmm. you find the backstory, you actually take a little bit of knowledge home with you. Mm -hmm. This is the way I was experienced to art. I grew up looking at things that had a message behind them, not just the appearance, but the depth. Mm. And the layers. The layers, yes. Well, let's talk about your collaboration with Hank Willis earlier this year. Sure. It was, you were dressed in black and white from head to toe, but mm -hmm. you've said that it's much deeper than black and white. It's the sure. subtlety and nuance that you wanted to discuss. How did that collaboration come to be, and what was it like for you to work on that project with him? Well, once again, Hank and I have been friends for years, and... Um, you've got I, a lot of great friends, right. I'm very fortunate. <laughs> Living in New York City, you know, we're, we're here. Right. So, um, a few years ago, I did um, a series of events that explored the history of American musical theater, a.k.a 
minstrel shows. Mm -hmm. um, and in that process, I was uh, re-envisioning them. In fact, I made a piece um, at The Box, which is a very famous mm -hmm. uh, venue in New York yep. called... Club Downtown. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I've it been was... there a few times. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and you made it out alive. I made it out <laughs> barely, but it was a blast. <laughs> yeah. So I did a piece called The Something Sweet, and it was exploring this idea of the minstrel show. So I, in fact, called it a post-minstrel cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea Ooh, was... You know I love a good pun. <laughs> <laughs> so I had an ensemble cast of several musicians and artists that I've worked through, uh, with for years. I'm a musician as well, so I composed the music, I did the costumes and the stage and so on. And as a result of that, I think Hank saw that piece and he had an interest in exploring aspects of that too. So rather than sort of going into um, territory that he thought I may have already explored, he called me up and was like, well, how can we go back into it and do something that uh, speaks of how we're both thinking of it now, five years after that project. Mm -hmm. And so that came um, with, um, the end result was me in this suit, um, dressed in white and black. And the idea was not so much the white and black, but actually the gray in between. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in the phrase, uh, both and, not either or. And I think a mistake that's often made here in North America is that we look at things in black and white, mm -hmm. and neither blacks or whites are monolithic cultures, mm -hmm. not to mention all the other cultures in between. Absolutely. Um, and the sooner we realize that, the sooner we can garner more respect for each other. Well, you make a good point there, and I know you've actually said that some, something similar to that within the New York Times. You were quoted saying that, you know, black and white is like the yin and the yang, the pathology and moralism, the life and death, and the super ego. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that and how that affected the process that you went mm -hmm. through? with Hank and how you helped inspire you with this project. Sure, well, you know, back on that note, um, I think we were both struck with this idea of things being seen in this binary system of black mm. and white, mm -hmm. when both of us have lives that are far more complex than that. I mean, all of us do. Mm -hmm. And um, so we sort of want to address that rather than showing the subtleties by giving you one image that was sort of a shocker to get you in. And then when you hear the backstory and learn a little bit more and see the expanse of that project, you start to see that this was much more of a unique process and a very physical process on my part um, in the poses and, the, and many of the uh, the actions that I did in that in that uh, photo shoot. We were actually curious about mm -hmm. that because we watched the video from the shoot, and we just it just looked so physically demanding to the both of us. Right. What mm -hmm. was that process like for you, and, and how hard was it on the body? You got to train for it. <laughs> um, you know, actually, I did train a bit for it, and I'm um, you know I've been a yoga practitioner for probably ten plus years. But interestingly enough, when I do projects like that, I sort of escape my corporeal being, mm -hmm. and I just get really involved with the process. So though the photo shoot took, took, photo shoot took around eight or nine hours, I don't really recall being tired. I was just so in the moment. And Hank is great to work with because he knows how to keep you going in front of the camera mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. say, no, that's not so much what we want, or pushing more in this direction. And it was a good back and forth. How did you all work together? I mean, did you take direction? Did you give direction? It was both. Mm -hmm. It was both. Um, you know, How collaborative I, was it actually? It was very collaborative, mm -hmm. actually. Um, he would um, suggest a pose or two, and then I would suggest a pose or two. And then I would look at the proofs, and then you know, modify to make things look a little bit better or extenuate certain aspects of the photo shoot. Mm. Now, I know you're going to be talking more about all your photo shoot and your creativity behind it with Marcus Samuelson uh, soon here. And you're also going to be talking about politics, social issues, uh, culture, mm -hmm. and how you were raised. You know, were, we, were you raised around the art world and the art scene? I know you studied a little bit in Japan once you went over there, but even at Morehouse, you didn't have that background. So where did you first get introduced to art and how? Well, interestingly enough, I became interested in art very, very young in Los Angeles, where I grew up by the paintings and the drawings that were in my house. My parents collected the work of Charles White, John Biggers, who is my cousin, um, Barbara Wesson, Varnett Honeywood, um, you know, artists that have been now claimed to be uh, black romantic artists and so on. And um, like I said before, looking at their art, it was actually learning something, not just looking at the imagery or the skill set behind making the images, but what was behind the images, the, um, the ideas that they were portraying. Um, then by the time I got to my teen years, hip hop, or I should say rap started, mm -hmm. and I was on the early string of Los Angeles B-Boys. I was break dancing, I was DJing, and I was doing graffiti. Can you still pop lock? Oh, I can still, I can go away. Show us a little something real quick. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pass it on. Oh. <laughs> I have to give a shout out to my good, good friend Eric Garcetti, who is now the mayor of Los Angeles. And I say this because a few weeks ago he was being interviewed and they asked him about a breakdance group that he and I used to be in. Wow. 
and they made him do exactly the same. No thing. way. He did a wave on stage. He did. So that's, that's a funny. shout back to Eric. Okay. All right. Like we'll make you do a centipede, <laughs> but next time we'll pull in out the cardboard yeah, box. Yeah, there we go. Right. On. Make it happen. Make it happen. <laughs> but on a more serious note, mm. how did graffiti influence the work that you do today? Um, I think it was about uh, improvisation, mm. um, about risk, about. Um, there's something almost very romantic about being a graffiti artist because here you are going out at night risking your safety, um, putting this masterpiece on a wall that you know very well could be erased the next day. Mm. So it's not even about the permanence of it, it's about the act. And I think that falls right in line with sort of my Buddhist studies, that it's not about the end result, but more about the process of getting there. I've made several pieces that are considered ephemeral because they won't be there forever. And when people look at them, they wonder why I would spend hundreds of hours to make something that doesn't last. But I think that is basically a metaphor for life. We do all this work on our bodies, but in an instant it could be gone. Mm -hmm. So what you really have to work mm -hmm. on is your inner qualities. Inner. Well, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that process. How do you even come up with these? Some of your uh, you know, art pieces are huge, they're massive. How, mm -hmm. Just not something you can just practice at home and then go and right. recreate at the gallery. How do you come up with this and what's that process like? Um, I, I don't know. I think, I think very large, mm. you know, um, and when I say that, I think in expansive environments mm -hmm. or like we almost, we call that installation half the time. So it's not just about an image on the wall, but creating an actual space for you to walk in where you can actually see something, hear something, learn something, smell something. In fact, the event I'm doing later this week is exactly that. Mm. You'll walk in and you'll see something, but you'll also hear this music from Santo Gold and from Quest, so it becomes an all <clears throat> encompassing experience. It's an oral experience, a tactile experience, an oral experience, all, all of the above. above. Well, I think this goes back into what I consider the griotic traditions from Africa, where there wasn't one specific name for poetry or for cooking or for dance or for music or for art. It was all sort of done in the name of communication and sharing. Well, I think it's interesting how you share things with people and try to educate them. Some of the things that other artists wouldn't even touch because they're mm -hmm. very controversial. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, this tree behind us, Blossom here, was done in commemoration of the Gina 6 incident, the prayer quilt about right after 9-11, mm -hmm. talking about Islam and th different things that are approached there. Why do you choose to touch such controversial issues, and how do you pick which issues that you'll shine light on? Well, I think in the West, specifically in America, we're very afraid to deal with heavy topics, mm -hmm. and everyone runs well, into the... it's post-racial America, isn't it, Sanford? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I've heard that phrase. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Didn't really do. stick for me, but... Um, <laughs> but the thing about it is, that the minute something truly topical comes up, people run into the cor their corners, or they go into their old black and white bag of tricks, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they gloss over everything. But through art, there's a means of grabbing your audience in through other means, and then later, revealing what the true intent of that work was. Mm -hmm. So. For example, when you see uh, the lotus blossom I talked about, you're seduced to get closer to it. And then the closer you get, you realize what that history is revealing. Mm. And I think that's sort of the way we learn things. Okay. Through culture. Through culture Absolutely. and experience. And so how do you pick which ones you want to you know, approach? Um, it really it depends. Um, I, if I have, um, let's say I have an exhibition coming up mm -hmm. in a specific venue or a, a different country, I do a bit of research. Okay. I often read a lot and listen to music and maybe a phrase will jump out or um, a couple of words will jump out and it will spark something in my mind and I figure out a way to elucidate that in three dimensions. Okay, nice. So you're currently a professor at Columbia mm -hmm. and you've taught all over, but you have yet to teach at a historically black college, even mm -hmm. though you attended Morehouse. I'm mm -hmm. just curious as to why. Well, um, I think it's something that I may do later in life. Mm -hmm. However, I do frequently go and speak at the black schools. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke at several of them, and I make myself available for that. But at the moment, you know, I'm sort of focused right here in New York City because this is my gateway to all the other places where I need to go. Because though I might be a professor, I'm still learning. And mm -hmm. at a certain point, I think I might be able to impart even more wisdom upon that very select demographic that's at a black college. Okay. So real quick, what's the most important lesson did you make sure you, you know, teach this next generation when you're going around teaching? Um, that if you get no rejections, that means you're not trying hard enough. You're mm -hmm. not putting yourself out like there. That. And through those rejections, you find out what to do better. You gain strength. You, bring, you gain fortitude. Mm -hmm. um, so to stick with it, never be dissuaded or disparaged and keep moving. So what's next for you, as if you don't have enough going on? <laughs> so much. Um, after uh, this crazy week that's coming up, uh -huh. I think I'm going to travel a little bit. Um, I have uh, a lecture um, that I'm speaking um, in uh, Switzerland later in the month, and then go check out the Biennale in Venice. Mm. 
Nice. And then maybe go for a little R&R &R in uh, East Asia, meditate for a little while. Oh, I'm, oh, so I'm so jealous. <laughs> I'm so jealous. <laughs> Sounds like the life. Oh. Well, continued success, and we'll definitely come check you out on your newest exhibit, Dark Star. Okay. And come back again soon, please. It'd be my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're watching Arise Entertainment 360.